Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery with Mark. Um, you know, I'm sure you're glad I'm interrupted that horrible music. Well, Friday rolls around again, yes indeed it is. Friday afternoon at the time of this recording and we're rocking on down towards the end of August and although they're talking about fires and floods overseas, um, all we've had is tremendously cold weather recently. Um, in fact, it's going to get down to zero in another uh, day or two down my way. So, um, you know, what people don't seem to understand is that um, nothing is ever even. You know, there seems to be some kind of um, odd perception that we um, are somehow in control of the universe and, and, and drive the weather and if we stop cows farting and get rid of combustion engines everything is going to stabilise and all of these disasters are going to halt but if you actually look back through history you'll see that uh, for the last ten and a half thousand years this planet has been warming and we didn't start it and uh, we're not going to change it it's true that we exacerbate it with our pollution, and I would never ever dare to suggest that pollution is a good thing. But to expect uh, the world's climate to somehow magically stabilise, I can guarantee you that's never going to happen. In fact, in the next decade we're going to see a lot more floods because the moon's uh, starting to get on a big wobble at the end of its 18 and a half year cycle. So, um, yeah, next decade's going to be extraordinarily challenging and the mistake that humankind has always made is that we build on the mouths of estuaries most of the time uh, for a water source and for flushing away the waste of a city. Now, that's how, you know, all the great cities were built. New York, Paris, London, you name it. Yeah, Cairo, all built on the mouths of great rivers. And, of course building on an estuarine floodplain uh, you're going to get flooded out at some point and that's exactly what's happened to each and every one of those cities at some point in their time and in fact many many times over and to talk about once in a hundred year floods is a nonsense when you've only got a hundred years worth of records <laughs> how are you going to tell you know that's just uh, throwing a dart at the board and hoping that people will believe you to belay their fears that doesn't work and that's the whole point. My show is about mental wellness and how this relates back to that as you create a lot of anxiety. When you talk about things like this and put the fear into people unnecessarily because um, it is far, far, far more important that we know the truth, deal with the truth and act accordingly so that we can be forewarned and forearmed. If we don't, and this puts a lot of unnecessary stress and on the people who are already um, on the edge and, and then they just get more and more worried. And we find this especially these days with misinformation. And at the moment we um, are dealing with a ramped up version of COVID-19, if you like, in the Delta variant, which is... Um, knocking on the door of our shores and the fact of the matter is that we need to open up to the world there is no question about it we don't have a choice and so at some point we need to open to the rest of the world because businesses are struggling so much people are on the brink there's an enormous amount of strain on small businesses especially which at the end of the day is the largest employer of people in this country small business so they're the ones that have suffered most the bigger businesses with bigger bank accounts can maybe ride this out maybe but it's those small ones that are really going by the wayside and um they need the help and the government can't just throw money at them and bail them out forever because the government's resources are limited. The printing more money will not solve the situation. People need to get back into business, which means that we need to open back up to the world. So it is imperative right now that we all get vaccinated. And this is not some propaganda, okay? This is not something that I want to do. Now, we've got the Pfizer vaccine, which is one of the safest and, and most efficacious of them all. I am going to get the vaccine not because I want to, and I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it for you, 
so I don't infect you, the rest of my people and my society. I'm doing it to protect those around me so that I don't transmit that disease to others. Now, there's no guarantees in this world. It's not a 100% cure-all. But what it does do is it knocks down the chances dramatically of this thing getting away on us. And I truly believe from behaviour past, from what we've done in the past, that we can get hold of this thing, we can control this, we can open our borders, and we do not need to panic or be worried. All we have to do is get that jab, okay? And we all need to do this as a nation. We need to support each other. We don't do it for ourselves, we do it for each other. And as a community, and this is what Arrow Radio and Wairapa TV and all us people are all about as our communities. All you folks up on the Carpety Coast and the beautiful Hawke's Bay out there and all throughout the Wairapa, I'm... I want to assure you that I am not trying to panic anybody. I am trying to get us all to work together to protect each other, to get our country and our businesses up and running again. We need to live in this new world. We can't bury our heads in the sand forever and ever. We can do it for a while. We can shut the gates for a while. I mean, we could even Robinson Crusoe it if we had to and keep the rest of the world out. But the reality of it is the world needs to open and get functioning again. We cannot live in stasis forever. So it is a national responsibility for all of us to get as much immunity as we can. Get that first jab, follow it up with that second. Encourage all your friends. And, you know, this is misinformation about how the government's trying to control you or inject something into you. This This is just myth and nonsense and people gullible people prepared to believe something and then you know pass this misinformation on with such fervor that they um persuade other people who were gullible or hesitant themselves if you've done the research then you know this is our best chance of keeping everybody safe keeping everybody calm, sticking together and working together as a community. Now is not the time for us to lose our heads. There's been a lot of anxiety, a lot of young people are growing up so worried about so many things now. The adults of our community, us older ones, we need to show the young ones how to put your head up, your shoulders back, be brave, be strong and support each other. We need to show these kids leadership and calm their anxieties and say, hey, look, we are watching out for you, young ones. We care about you and you are our future. We do this for you, not just for ourselves. We build this world for you and we want you to know that we value you and we want to protect you and look after you and enable you to look after yourselves as well you know, enable you to learn from this so that when this happens in the future, you'll be forewarned and forearmed. You'll say, hey, I know, we got through this before and we can do it again and we know how. We learn from these experiences. And, you know, it was funny, I was watching Stephen Colbert and he said, you know, we haven't had anything like this for over 100 years. And I was thinking, oh, yes, we have, my friend. We had the Spanish flu 100 years ago. And it seems we didn't learn enough from it at the time. In just a few generations, it was all forgotten. And I didn't even realise the extent of it, even though I'd done a bit of research on it. I didn't realise just how much misreporting there was at the time. And there was at least double the number that they actually stated that died because of that. And they called it the Spanish flu because it was first identified in Spain. Well, it wasn't from Spain and it wasn't a flu either but that's the that's the the handle it got unfortunately um we didn't act very well then and I've done a lot of research about plagues and stuff over the years long long before COVID ever came I've been researching the stuff for decades the weather and and pandemics and outbreaks all over the world I've 
you know, I've done all the tracing of all the different ones all throughout time, you know, 523, 24 BC in Constantinople, Holbein's time in the 10 to 1100s, another outbreak again in the 1660s. Those were the three major outbreaks of bubonic plague, but cholera also just about killed London until Basil Jet cleaned up the sewers. So, you know, there's been many pandemics and we we talk about them in myth and legend but then we forget exactly how to get on top of these things and it is not easy unfortunately medicine is not the golden wand we wish it was and really when it comes down to it it's about personal responsibility first and community responsibility second and the only people who are going to solve this problem is us and we need to be calm and move forward together and not panic and not spread false rumours but just get on with the job of looking after each other and we will we will come through this and we will have a better world not too far from here should another variant break out then fine we can close the borders and we can be safe all of us if that is necessary, that can be done, but that is an absolute last resort. We do not want to be looking down that negative track at this point. We've got to go forward with full hearts, high heads, full of hope and strength and work together to get through this, and I'm pretty sure that we can do it. You know, I've seen a lot of terrible things in my time. I've lived in Africa, and you know that opens your eyes to the world, and you see you know, just how many terrible diseases and how much suffering there is in the world is absolutely unbelievable and speaking of suffering I I went to see a friend of mine and this is getting off the subject now of, of diseases this is more well although my friend Christine she's um yeah she's paralyzed from uh, the neck down okay and she's been that way for quite some period of time but I knew her when she was a young lady when she went to school and I travelled with her and her brothers around Europe and she lived with us for a while and she was a very vibrant, lovely young girl, full of life, a good friend and she got married, she had three kids, the oldest one a boy, lovely boy, twin girls. She had a great marriage, a great life, great kids, taught around the world, was a really, really good teacher, taught the young gangsters of New York, we were talking about that just the other day when I went to visit her, and, you know, considering that she's absolutely puckerooed, you know, I'm, I'm talking tetraplegic, she can't feed herself, she can't, you know, wash herself or wipe herself or nothing, but you've never met a more positive person in all your life, you never met someone who was so intelligent, so um, clear in her mind and so powerful with her spirit, with her heart, with her soul, with her mind. She is absolutely fearless and will stand down any gangster even though she's incapable of even lifting an arm because what she does, she uses her mind, her thoughts, her intelligence, her power to talk to people and get through to them. And that just goes to show that it doesn't matter how big and tough you are. Toughness comes from the inside. Strength, that's where it really resides, inside your heart and your mind. And you can be strong regardless of your situation. And you can be positive even though life seems so gloomy and she's been through terrible times, breakdowns, mental illness, all kinds of of horrible, horrible situations. She suffered terribly in, in homes where she was not looked after at all. In fact, her, her well-being, her, her physical well-being was constantly threatened. She was always in danger. And now she lives in a lovely, lovely place not too far from Mission Bay around Auckland Way and, you know, she's finally got somewhere really nice to live and, and, and life is good for her. And it's just a damn shame that it took so long and she's had to suffer so much. And we were talking about suffering and struggling and, you know, I said to her as a writer, I really feel that if I hadn't have had all the struggle, um, I wouldn't have 
done what I can do. I wouldn't have the same resources to draw upon. My stories probably wouldn't be as dramatic, but um, nor would my appreciation of good things be as great. You know, only when you've been without can you appreciate what it is to have something. You know, when you've been without water for a long, long time, boy, do those first few drops ever taste so very good. And the same with food. You know, when you've starved, your first meal, well, you don't really remember it much, but it's pretty good, I remember. And, um, you know, we talked about that, and, you know, she quoted me the opening lines from, from Charles Dickens's Tale of Two Cities, the best of times, the worst of times, and... I replied, yes, indeed, in the epoch of incredulity. And and that, to me, is what this is, this, this world that I have grown up in. You know, I grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s. So I've had 50 years of incredible change in this world. I've watched all kinds of things happen. Uh, the crash of 87, uh, uh, all, all the banks lending money in 2006, 2007 and going belly up in, in the United States with Ponzi schemes and all the rest of it. The end of of the Eastern Bloc of Communism, the Berlin Wall coming down, Nelson Mandela being released from Robben Island and, and finally uh, apartheid being ended in South Africa, Bikini Atoll and the French with their uh, nuclear explosions out in the Pacific and, and everyone getting together and, and fighting that. The Springbok riots in New Zealand, the list goes on and on of all the amazing things that I've lived to see. The turn of the millennium, which I, I never ever thought I would get to see, and, and there it was, you know, I was in Welly watching the fireworks and, and waiting for K2 to happen and all the computers to crash, which of course never did, but I didn't care anyway because I was licked up watching the fireworks. I didn't give a shite about computers falling over. But, you know, it's it's been a pleasure and a privilege um, to see all that I did and, and there's been a lot of terrible suffering in my life. I've now lost all but one of my family members and, and I wouldn't say we're particularly close, unfortunately, but... You know, watching people die, burying people, going through all of those terrible things in life. Um, here's another quote for you. And he woke tomorrow morning sadder and a wiser man. The end of Moby Dick. And um, I think that's what it is. The older you get, the sadder and wiser. But I like to think that there is always... A, a, a reason to find happiness. You need to find that reason. And the more I see of nature and the more I see of this country, the more I realise how very, very lucky I am, how privileged I am to live in such a wonderful place. I mean, physically it is it is paradise, but also some wonderful people in this country. Some, not all. Many of them really just bloody annoy me, but, you know, there are some great people in this country and... I don't think there really is anywhere else in this world that I would rather live than here. This truly is paradise, and we do have our problems, sure we do, and, you know, our our issues with racism still boil on in this country. You know, recent remarks made from, from the hurricanes just don't wash with me at all, you know. Um, we need to learn to celebrate the indigenous people of this country and elevate them to the status that they deserve, uh, which is an equal partner. This surely was what we signed up for all those years ago back in 1840 and it's never been honoured. We know that. In fact, you know, um, Maori are overrepresented in all the worst statistics in this country and underrepresented in all the best simply because of one simple fact, and that's racism. It's the way it is. Is, is now. Was then, is now. And needs to be sorted. And it's just about respect. You know, the, the Muslims who unfortunately got, you know, dealt to by that evil, evil bastard they'll tell you that too. It's about acceptance, it's about understanding, it's about loving God and, and being grateful for being here and not 
you know, you know, being delivered from evil. And and you can only be delivered by evil for by by forgiving your trespasses, by not allowing yourself to be eaten up by that, but getting on with your life and and I always say life is for the living and you've got to get on with that. It's easy to give up sometimes. I mean, I was locked in a room for six months and never, I don't think I even drew the curtains in that period of time, you know. There is always suffering. But there is always an end to that suffering one way or another. Nothing is forever. And if you can see just that tiniest of lights, just hold on to that hope. Hold on to that with everything you've got and use that to get you just one step forward. You know, the, the first steps you take on the road to recovery are the hardest, always the hardest, and often you get setbacks and, you know, sometimes you'll get knocked down two, three, four times and if you don't keep getting up, well, then you just stay knocked down. That's not good for anyone. So, you know... I always encourage people to take that first step, but be gentle with yourself. You know, give yourself something that's achievable, just some small goal that you can get to first and and then sit there and enjoy it for a wee while. You know, that warm glow of achievement and thinking, well, you know, I've actually made some progress. And even if it's just cleaning the kitchen, you know, getting it, clean and sparkly and just sitting there and not being surrounded by trash and mess and just sitting down and having a cup of tea at the end of it and looking around at your handiwork and saying that's nice I like that this is what I want this is where I want to be and it, it can be a, a pivotal moment where you say hey I want to change what's been happening because I don't like it and I need to make it a little bit better now, in the past, mental health, and even when I started the show many, many years ago, mental health was an issue that was misunderstood because of a lack of understanding. There was a lot of ignorance. And so people took some pretty shitty attitudes towards me, towards a lot of other people, and they'd say things like, oh, just harden up, or, oh, we all get that, you know, and, and be dismissive. But now the conversation has opened up a lot more thanks to people like John Kerwin and Mike King who, by the way, really, really, really needs your support and he is the best man out there to do the job. So get in behind Mike King and support him. He's there for the young ones to help them get to a better place, but for everyone. you know, Mike's in it for everyone, not himself. He's giving of himself and I'm sure it costs him dearly. I can see... Emotionally, he's distraught at times, and I really worry about you, Mike, but hang on in there, brother, because, you know, you know that you're doing probably the most important work you've ever done in your life, and so many of us are so very, very grateful for the sacrifices you make, and we are listening and we are trying. We just kind of wish that the government would listen to you a little bit more, mate. And for Stan Walker, thank you very much too, young man. Um, I think you're going to be the best dad that's ever been one day. Um, You've been to hell and back, I know, and you're an inspiration to all those young people. Uh, you know, you've really given someone to look up to and understand that, you know, you get over things, you forgive, you move forward with your life, and if you believe in yourself enough, you can become an international star like, like Stan. I mean, it's doable. He's proved it. You know, he's come from the worst of circumstances and gone as far as you can go. He's, he's recognised the world over and he's a, a kind and a good man. And those are the sort of people that we really need in this country to be role models for for young Maori, for, for the Polynesians, for us Whitey too. You know, everyone, everyone needs heroes like Stan um, and Mike and, and John Kerwin and all those other people who've contributed you know so much of themselves without okay maybe they get some accolades but hey mate you can't eat accolades can you you know they could have been doing a lot more for themselves and saying well why should i care but instead of treating it all with indifference you know they came a point in their lives where they said we need to change this no matter what it takes and they really have 
made tremendous sacrifices and continue to do so. So at the very least, they deserve our support, our love, you know, our assistance where we can. And, you know, together as communities, we can move forward. You know, I've noticed a lot of changes in the wire wrapper. The food bank's working really hard. If you can make a contribution, it'd be very nice. It's good to see Countdown getting in behind them and uh, supporting them. There aren't many people right now who are suffering, but food banks right across the country have been busier and busier and busier, and, you know, more and more people are struggling. Um, So we need to think about those people because it's really just a matter of redistribution of wealth. It's not that the money's not there, it's just that there's not enough care in this world for those people to get the assistance that they need. And, you know, don't be all judgy about it. It's easy to fall. You might think you're safe and secure today, but you could be struck down by ill health, lose your job, no one else wants to give you one. Anything could happen out of the blue, and does. And, you know, these people don't choose to be where they are. And they are suffering and deserve a bit of help and assistance. So think about the poor. I've noticed a lot of changes around the place. I was in Napier the other day. And I can't believe from the Talbo turn off to Eskdale was not one gas station. I was running on fumes by the time I come into Napier. But it was very, very nice to drive through there and see the place again. And I noticed there was quite a nice buzz about the town. And also I've noticed in the Wairarapa, people are treating each other with a bit more consideration and respect, which is really, really heartwarming to hear that the pleases and the thank yous like I've never heard before is really a tribute to the way people have behaved during COVID. They've got this idea that, hey, maybe it's time for a little bit more kindness and a little bit less selfishness. There's still a hell of a lot of people who are just locked into themselves and care for nothing but. But there are quite a few people just starting to get it that, They need to be a bit more mindful, a bit more grateful of what they have and a bit more mindful of others and how they feel, you know. They feel just like you and it's one a kind word. It's not so very much. It doesn't really cost you a lot or anything, you know. Um, Don't push in in front of people. That's, you know, those sort of common courtesy things. Showing people, if you're in a line of traffic and you can see someone trying to get in, Stop and let them go. Wave them in. Let them go. You're in a line of traffic. What's it going to cost you? One second? Let them in. Show a bit of consideration. I always try to. I stop at the crossings. Let people cross on it. They've got right of way. Let them go. It costs you a few seconds. You're going to catch up to the traffic jam quick enough. Don't you worry. So, you know, just... Thinking about things a little more more, rather than just being push, 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 grab, grab, grab all the time. I want us to come out of COVID a better world than what we went in. And I honestly believe that we can. You know, community radio to me is very important because it's for the community. It's a not-for-profit organisation. Now, Arrow's always short of dough. So if you can make a contribution, any kind, that would be awfully sweet. Because this is a service that people provide. I don't get paid for what I do. Michael and Veronica, champions that they are who run this place, could get much better jobs, much better paying. But they do this because they believe in it. They care about their society and they want to make it a better place. Why Rapper TV's come on board. They've been wonderful to us, you know, allowing us to get the word out. By the way, there's a website, www.arrow. You can see the podcasts of all the previous shows that have gone on. It's a great website. There's always stuff going on all around the wire wrapper. And if you haven't been here in a while, I'll tell you what, it'll blow your mind when you come and see what's happening with Marston. She's just going boom, boom, boom. Loads of people have finally listened to me and discovered how good the wire wrapper is. Climate's great. There's NAFL, traffic jams. It's not like Auckland bumper to bumper to bumper. And by the way, just in finishing off, well done the All Blacks for the win, but I thought the Aussies did great, maybe even deserved to win themselves. So she's going to be a good test tomorrow, and I just want to wish the All Blacks good luck. Lads, do your best. 
do us proud. If you lose, we still love you, but just give it your all, give it your best, no matter what happens, thumbs up. Okay, thanks everybody, and I'll try and be here next week for you, do another show. Thanks for tuning in, tell your friends, and um, thanks to all the sponsors who have helped out our show. And thank you most of all for tuning in. Hope you enjoy. Cheers for now. Bye.